Welcome everybody and thank you for dialling in today and giving us some of your time to um, go through what we've found, what I've found for the scale um, in the areas that we've been doing the work. So today's presentation is obviously on insect scaling grapevines. So we'll just go back. Um, so really um, this is just to show you what we're looking at and the size of the scale. It gives you a really good indication of what what the size is in the vineyards that you need to be looking for. So this is a page out of the AWRI dog book. Um, so at the back of the book and you can see the size of the scale just sitting there. So if we go through why are we discussing scale today and the importance of scale in vineyards. So increasingly um, the number of scale observed in the field has really increased probably since 2011. Um, and that's probably been highlighted to growers through the increased level of honeydew and sooty mould at harvest time. Often um, we're out there at, at, uh, during vintage and noticing honeydew or sooty mould and we'll see lots of photos of that and just wondering what's generated that and, and often if we look uh, deeper into the vine it's often is scale. Um, it has a wide geographical distribution so since we started this project officially probably 12 months ago we now know that you know, it's in the Hunter Valley, it's uh, through the, the Canberra region into Victoria, um, the southeast, Langhorn Creek, McLaren Vale, right up through the Clare Valley, Adelaide Hills. Probably not a lot through the Riverland um, that I know of, but that may just be because we haven't been um, notified of that yet. Very little is really known about scale. There was a PhD done a couple of years ago, um, but really about their control and there's a limited number of products available um, for their control. If we have a look what is known about scale, we have um, probably six scale that have been identified in vineyards. So uh, grapevine scale um, has yellow eggs and yellow crawlers and, and we're certain we have that one in Langhorn Creek and, and wider. Frosted scale is probably the most common that we see, which is in Langhorn Creek, Barossa, in Valley, McLaren Vale. We have this one that we can't really identify yet, which we're not sure whether it's a soft brown scale or a black scale. Reportedly in the literature, soft brown scale have these crawlers born alive and we've never seen that in, in the work that I've done through Langhorn Creek and, and um, into the hills and Barossa. So it may be a misidentification, it may be black scale. These other two really, um, this one they don't really know if there is an egg phase um, and the long soft scale has crawlers born alive and I've never seen scale in the vineyard that that miss an egg phase. So at the moment we're thinking that we probably have maybe these four scales in the region that, that we're looking at. In terms of a life cycle, this is the life cycle of a con the, what, what we thought was all the scale, was grapevine scale. Obviously we're in this winter phase now and, and we'll see lots of photos of the immature scale overwintering. Typically through this phase here coming into spring is when we um, we used to do all the oil sprays um, to try and control them. We then know that they rapidly mature through this spring uh, phase. The females mature, they lay eggs and generally around 80% um, catfall those eggs hatch and we have crawlers that come out. They then migrate up to the leaves and uh, are on the leaves. Generally around harvest they tend to start migrating back down and um, go into overwintering again on the canes. In terms of what we have currently for the control of scale, um, you know, I'm not saying that these are what we want to use, but this is what's there. So we have chlorpyrifos, or what's known as laws ban, is, a, is one named product. There's lots of them um, that has scale on the on the label, but really isn't recommended by um, any of the wine companies. Paraffinetic oil. Um, Bioclear Biopest is uh, registered for a winter spray. Um, Applaud is one that is registered for mealybug but not scale but has been used in the trial work and I'll explain that. What is commonly used at the moment is a winter or summer oil sprayed um, just after pruning, um, very rate dependent and we're starting to think that probably the, the the effectiveness of that spray is not as great as we initially thought. We've then got a couple of other um, I suppose um, OPs, we've got the Maldison and the Suprathinin. Suprathinin is S7, so we 
tend to try and avoid anything that's really an S7. And then Transform is another one that came into the market for Mealybug, um, not Scale, that we have also included in the trial work. So really at the moment, you know, our options are probably only the oil sprays. Conventional control has been this dormant oil spray, generally of a mineral oil because it was cheaper than a paraffinetic oil. And the rates generally were somewhere around that 15 to 60 litres a hectare. Mineral oil is generally three litres a hectare. So, you know, if you're spraying 500 litres a hectare, you're ending up with um, 15 litres. If you're spraying the 2,000 litres a hectare to really wet that cord on, then you're somewhere around the 60. The success of this spray has really varied across districts um, and that's due to the timing of the scale and probably what scale you have in your vineyard. So, you know, when we're looking at spraying this, the scale is quite um, deeply hidden under the bark and under crevices and very difficult to get to. And so often growers think they've killed the scale whereas all that's really happened is that the, they've matured and hatched and, and moved on. So if we have a look what scale we're dealing with, here is what we think are two, and I will keep saying that because we actually haven't had these positively identified by entomologists. It's just really through observation of what what we or myself and those that I work with think they are. So here um, on the right, you can see quite an elongated scale that we are calling a grapevine scale, compared to these three here that are rounded with this white sort of nearly a webbing effect that we are calling frosted scale. So if we go on, this is the vine scale, very brown, very elongated, around the 10 centimetres when mature. And then underneath, this is the frass, once it hatches, you know, if you lift a scale through the season, you'll, you'll see sort of a white or a browny frass underneath where it's hatched. These, um, similarly, the, the frosted scale are very similar, the frass is generally white. These are the ones that we're a little bit concerned about, that we don't really know what they are. You can see this is a pediol, so this is through the season, we have these other scale that are constantly maturing. Um, if you go back to that life cycle, the vine scale, grapevine scale and frosted scale are reported to have only one life cycle a year. So they go through, they hatch in October, grow through the season, mature, um, lay eggs again through spring and, and hatch in October. Whereas these uh, scale seem to be maturing and hatching right through the season. So this is the one that's, that is starting to cause quite a few problems in vineyards. You can see here in March, 10th of March, um, we have clearly eggs under this scale, um, which isn't what the literature reports. Um, so maybe and, and maybe brown scale or the black scale, um, but definitely eggs. Um, so what we did in response to these number of scale that are out there is um, last year we applied for some AGWA funding, a, a regional trial to look at scale predominantly in Langhorne Creek, but it covers um, the central region, which is McLaren Vale and the Adelaide Hills. We had two sites at Langhorne Creek. We used four products. Um, once again, I'll just say that these are not registered for scale, but they were products that looked interesting that controlled scale in other crops. So Movento is the Bayer product, um, not registered, but I believe it may be registered this year for Mealybug. Transform um, is a Dow product registered for Mealybug. Paraffinetic oil, which is registered uh, for powdery mildew through the season at about one litre a hectare and for scale through winter at a higher rate. Applaud, um, another product registered for Mealybug, and then obviously the control. So at each site we had four reps. Um, this was applied um, with a four-wheeler bike and a little tank and sprayed to the point of runoff. We applied it at 80% catfall um, because these products rely on controlling the crawlers. Uh, and most of these products have a withholding period of 80% catfall. So we were trying to match the hatching of the crawlers with the time or the window that we could use that product. Um, so they all went on at around that 80% catfall. In conjunction with that, we had a bigger trial where applaud um, because that was the one growers were quite interested in looking at and we thought might have a good fit. Um, a block trial was done. So half a block was sprayed with applaud um, in conjunction with um, these smaller trials and that was done um, 
in agreement with the winery that that fruit was going to, so um, that was all okay. So that's what we did. In addition to that, we have quite a few observation sites where really I just go out and monitor what the scale is doing and that's how we've discovered that there's more than one scale out there. So we have about five sites in Langhorne Creek, one in Eden Valley, one in the Barossa, uh, one in Adelaide Hills and one in McLaren Vale where really it's just looking at what the scale is doing when it's hatching um, its life cycle really through the season. So I'll just go through quite a lot of photos now just to sort of show you what we're seeing in the field. Um, now this is all just done uh, with iPhones and a small camera, so um, fairly low tech, but you, it's amazing what you can discover out there in the field. So this obviously, most of these are taken towards the end of the season when I'm doing the assessment of that trial and I'll go through how we did that um, shortly. So here you can see we've got eggs, um, we've got an quite an immature crawler here and then a, another scale that's a, a bit further through, um, you know, probably two different ages there of nymphs. Here you can see um, what we think is the brown scale or, or maybe the black scale with some crawlers that have just hatched around that, that same date. Um, so they initially have, you know, quite distinct legs and little eyes before they mature to the next phase or instar. Um, once again, just showing you the eggs here um, with some of the, the scale or the crawlers that have just hatched out. Uh, so also what we're finding that is quite confusing as we try and work out a control mechanism is this varying age of scale. So you've got some maturing, some that are sort of um, larger than a nymph but not quite matured to the full female size. Um, so that's what we're seeing in the field. When I'm doing the assessment, we do that mainly under microscopes and we're looking at, uh, we have discs so that I, I do it all, so that we are measuring the same size on the leaf, leaf so it's not dependent on leaf size as to how many scale we're getting and we just I just count how many scale I'm seeing um, per leaf. So you can see them here, we think these are the frosted scale, um, quite white sitting along the vein of the leaf. Um, and if you look in here, generally I have a disc that I place over here so I'm counting the same area each time but you can see within this little small section here there's probably about 10 or 12 scale. So over that entire leaf surface, you know, there's possibly on some leaves up to 200 um, nymphs on the back of a leaf. So very large numbers um, out there in the vineyards. These are the brown scales, so we're sort of counting them all as one group. I was this year until we sort of worked out that we're probably dealing with more than one beast. What often growers do is they've sprayed that oil spray in winter, they come out into the field through the season, they can see these um, scale here, they'll knock those off and they fall off easily so they think that they've controlled the scale, whereas really all that's happened is that these have matured, laid eggs and died and the scale have moved up to here on the leaves and so whether they had sprayed or not, those scale would be dead um, because that's a natural process in the life cycle. So growers are now realising that maybe what they have been doing hasn't been as, as successful as they initially thought. So these are the um, vine scale and then you can see them here on the backs of the leaves. Um, once again, very high numbers um, where you're seeing those um, mature female scale. They're quite a brownie colour and you can see here once again this is what we are counting under the microscope to work out effectiveness of control. They're not always out on the leaf, um, these are some shown here on the petiole, they can be on the canes um, but generally the leaf is a fairly good indicator of where to look. And the problem we have is that in the literature we thought there would only be one hatching and that we would be counting uh, one life cycle but you can see here there's a fairly mature uh, female scale with quite an immature nymph um, walking across it. So what we're finding in the regions that I'm monitoring is uh, quite a range in life cycle. Here you can see it producing some honeydew um, out of this maturing female as it feeds and once again there's a very immature nymph um, on that same shoot. So 
what we did was we sprayed that trial out in October. Um, I monitored it through the season and then in, um, as we came into vintage, it was a destruction trial, so all the fruit was put on the, on the ground. We then collected leaves, um, about twice I collected leaves, 10 leaves per panel, marked a disc size on it and we counted the numbers. Really there was no significant difference uh, between the products we used and the control and we think that's because the number of scale in the two sites we selected were just so high that those products um, really weren't strong enough to knock back that population. You know, we were counting generally, over, or I was counting generally over 50 nymphs or, or um, scale per leaf. So. Um, really the timing to get that pro those products to work is difficult, but we will repeat that trial again this year. So why are we really, you know, so concerned in doing all this work around scale? What are the, what's the end result of having scale in your vineyard, I suppose, is sooty mould. That's where growers tend to start recognising that there may be an issue. So you can see here um, sooty mould on the leaf, um, you can see here all the scale on the back of that leaf. If you look into a vineyard, now these photos are taken across Barossa, Eden Valley, Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale and Langhorne Creek. You can see here, you know, lots of scales on these shoots, there'd be, you know, nymphs on the back of these leaves and you're starting to see the blackening effect. This is some honeydew um, dripping off the berries where we have high numbers of scale. And then we get this uh, mould that comes in. We did take some down to Barbara Hall to get it identified and we'll do more around that this year just to get correct identification of what sooty mould actually is. You can see it is just grows on the surface of the berry, um, blackening off that fruit and making the fruit, you know, not, um, we can't pick that fruit if it's got a high level of sooty mould, rejectable. Um, so you can just see it really is, it doesn't go into the berry at all, it's quite a superficial, sits on the surface of those um, berries. And here's, you know, late in the season, these ones were some we, I just collected last, uh, the other week, very black, uh, thick sooty mould and you can see in here all the blackening, the blackening of the fruit. So really um, it's the sooty mould that causes the problem from the scale as well as a lot of reduced vigour in the vineyards that have high level of scale. So in response to the level of sooty mould, um, some of the work done in the West is they wash off the sooty mould. Um, obviously we don't have a control through the season for scale. So I just went to Bunnings and bought some products to see if we could wash off um, the sooty mould to make those fruit so that we could pick them. Um, and it, once again all destruction fruit went on the ground. So Natra soap is a product they use in the West to, to potassium soap to wash off um, sooty mould that's generated from mealybug and then I just tried a variety of other products. So what we did was we chose just a metre by metre section um, within a vineyard and sprayed it to the point of runoff with some of these products just to see what effect it had on the scale and what effect it had on the sooty mould. So you can see here, this is, um, most of them were fairly similar to this. This is eco-fungicide or what you may know as eco-carb. You can see here the sooty mould is sitting quite high on those berries. Where we've sprayed, it did dull the sooty mould quite a lot and dry it out to some effect, but really we still wouldn't be able to pick that fruit. So we really can't flush or wash off that sooty mould. We need to be able to control those scale earlier in the season. And this was just interesting, this is obviously uh, the vinegar that was recommended by the guys who do the citrus work and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later um, in that vinegar can control some insects. So you can see here though wetting is with any sprays always an issue and we can see here the vinegar drop and the scale there. So unless we can wet those scale or get um, good penetration we're never going to be able to wash off sooty mould or kill the scale. Just some observations, um, growers often ask where to look for scale. This is out at um, Eden Valley, Adelaide Hills. You can see here this has got a very high infestation. Um, it's on the butts of the vine, up and down here all the way. Um, you can see it here. Once again, this is what growers often see in their vineyard, go and flick those, they're dead so they think they've controlled them, whereas often the scale are now just sitting in here under the bark. 
if we peel back, this is the same site, you can see um, the varying growth stages, this is probably a mite, um, varying growth stages of scale in that vineyard um, at different sizes at, at the same time. And just a closer up so you can see that there probably is a mite in here as well. So really from the observation we've done, we've noticed that really Chardonnay and Shiraz um, have quite a high incidence. Um, Cabernet probably doesn't, you still can find scale but it doesn't seem to um, take off as easily as it does in, or get out of control as it does in Chardonnay, Shiraz, Sauvignon Blanc, um, we find it a little bit in Merlot. Really spur pruning has the ability to cut out scale better than minimal pruned but we find it in both of those vineyards so it's not like you know it's just in minimal pruned. Um, so that gives us an idea of sort of this, the spread of scale across different blocks. So we're now looking at doing a third trial um, in light that those softer um, type products didn't work as well as we'd hoped. So we're now looking at doing some dormant spray um, trials with chlorpyrifos. Um, you know, we could use any of the OPs, I suppose we've chosen chlorpyrifos. Uh, we'll do a chlorpyrifos with biopest, just biopest or that paraphernetic oil by itself. We will put applaud in there again just to um, rate that softer control option and then we're looking at doing some different rates um, just to see whether the 1000 litres is enough or whether we could go with um, lower rates and, and similarly lower rates of chlorpyrifos. The other one that we're in discussion um, about putting in is Semurai which is a, a group 4A insecticide, one of the neonicotinoids and we're looking at applying that through the drip. It's registered for merely bark, not scale, um, but we're just interested in having a look at that and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So what we do, what we will do for this next trial is we go out, um, find the blocks obviously. Um, generally when we do these, we peel back the bark so that and take photos of it, tag them all, have about eight sites per treatment um, so that we can if it's killing the scale when they're exposed, then we have a better hope of killing them when they're covered. Um, if it's not going to kill the scale when they're exposed, then it has no hope of killing them when they're covered by bark. So this is just a quick and easy way of me monitoring the effect um, of, of the sprays on direct spray onto the scale. So that's what we're looking for. And we do some little um, desk trials where we just collect some of the scale and put them on trays and spray them with a misting to see what the products are doing. So that'll be our next, we you know take some photos so we know the growth stage that we're looking to control and um, we'll monitor that. So that one will be put out probably in August um, with hope that we may get some control of the scale. The other thing I just thought I'd mention briefly, given that these two tend to run pretty much together, obviously, is mealybug. Um, you can see here a scale and a mealybug. Um, mealybug have a similar effect, so often it's difficult for growers to determine which one they have. Um, if we look here, the mealybug will also produce some honeydew. Um, if you have high levels of mealybug in bunches, you'll get this white webbing and mould, you know, your secondary botrytis will come in on that. You can see there's lots of mealybugs on this bunch. Um, the honeydew created by those mealybug. And then this is a leaf that's really just dripping. It's got scale and mealybug in this site, so there's a lot of honeydew generated. And this just shows you a very visual effect um, of what the honeydew looks like when you get high numbers of scale and mealybug in your vineyard. Um, obviously on white grapes it's a lot easier to see. Um, you know, the sooty mould on a, on a red grape is often hidden by the colour of the grape. Um, if you're getting this in your Chardonnay and your Sauvignon Blancs and your whites, um, very easy to see the, the honeydew and the sooty mould. So here we can see that often these two are working together, that there's scale and the mealybug in the same block. So the products we're using are hopefully going to control both of these products. And I do monitor for mealybug when we're doing the trials as well. The other thing that growers often, um, particularly at this time of the year, when we're looking at um, monitoring for scale um, is mites that 
often growers will flick up the um, shell of an old scale and see something moving around and thinking it's eggs and crawlers again. Often the mites have come in um, and they then, you know, go for protection under these old scale shells. So often if you flick those at this time of the year, there will be some little white um, insects under those and they're often these mites that you can see um, throughout this photo that have just come in and are using those scale shells as, as a point of protect, protection. So important to be able to identify the difference between crawlers and mites. Um, the mites are quite a bit smaller. So where to now? Um, earlier this year before, just before Easter, I had a, a meeting um, here at the AWRI uh, to catch up with some entomologists um, from SARDI and the University of Adelaide to try and help us to do some identification work. And we're looking at doing some, um, maybe some DNA work um, to try and identify which species we have. Probably through that discussion, the recommendation is really probably a biopest plus an insecticide in late um, winter, early spring. Um, there obviously is concerns, concerns about the, the impact that that'll have on the beneficial insects when we start using some, you know, OP insecticides in the vineyards. Also some concern about the life cycle, you know, those scale um, nymphs are well hidden under the bark and just whether we are actually going to get the control we want. We need to find a control through winter because obviously in season there's no control and we've got no way of controlling that sooty mould once it gets going. What else are we looking at doing as part of this? We do have funding to run for another year um, from AGWA, so we're looking at putting out some tiny tags, really just to look at whether the insect is, you know, if we have a really cold winter, whether that's killing it off, if we have a really hot spring or hot summer and the insect scale out on the leaves, whether that's knocking down some of the population. We're just doing some uh, discussion with growers about their spray programs and whether we can identify, you know, some sprays that are uh, inducing higher scale populations and other growers that maybe aren't using insecticides. So that's really just to, ha to have a look at what's happening. There's been some discussion around sulphur. Obviously now growers often put sulphur in every single spray because they're concerned about resistance and resistance management. Um, so they're not giving sulphur a break, they're using quite high levels of sulphur and whether that's knocking some of our beneficials. Certainly in our discussions where Avatar has been used a lot, we tend to see um, increased numbers of scale um, because the Avatar may be knocking out some of the beneficials and we're just not sure whether you know, some of our other insecticides, the proclaim, the prodigies, what effect they're having or the coppers having um, on the population of beneficials. So we really want to do some identification work of the scale so that then we could look at bringing in some beneficial insects rather than just relying on um, insecticides. So that's why this identification of what we have out there is important so that then maybe we can do some cover cropping and bring in some beneficials. We will repeat um, the trial we did with Mavento and Applaud on a site that has a lower number of scale in it to see if we can get, once the population's knocked down, some response from those, that chemistry. Um, I spoke about using paraphernetic oil rather than a mineral oil. Um, that was because I've had quite a bit of discussion with the um, the researchers that do the citrus work and they found that in citrus the paraphernetic oils certainly work better than the mineral oils and the closer you can get to 100% paraphernetic, the better the control is. The oil sits um, on the insect scale a lot better, closer to its um, shell uh, and they've just found that that works better. Obviously samurai is something that we're looking now at trialling. Um, I'm certainly not recommending that that growers go and use samurai, it's not registered for scale, but it's a soil application that is fully systemic through the vine and things that suck on the vine are then controlled. So where it's been trialled um, in the Hunter previously, we've seen some good results from that. So certainly we will um, incorporate that into the trial work we're doing now. And um, you know we will get control of mealybug with these. The other thing that um, has come to light sort of in the last month or so is that Dr. Paul Cooper at the Australian National University has had a student that's just finished a PhD and has another PhD uh, that I don't think he's filled yet 
where they're so out of Canberra that they're doing some work on feeding and ecology of grapevine scale and I'm discussing with him doing some of the identification work um, for us um, if, if the DNA work um, that we're looking at doing here in Adelaide isn't successful. So we've now made contact with him to try and um, work on this identification side of things. Obviously a disclaimer that all the products that I've used here are uh, trial products. Um, if you're going to look at that Biopest Plus, a insecticide, um, you need to contact your grape purchaser before because obviously those products aren't um, in the dog book and may not, or maybe in the dog book but may not be a, um, allowable by your grape purchaser. So always check. And um, obviously some of the products are either not registered or not registered for the control of scale. So they were destruction trials where we put that fruit on the ground. Um, so there will be no change to that registration at this point. Um, obviously I've had lots of growers who've really helped out in this um, with putting out some of these sprays um, and notifying me when they have scale so we can go and have a look. So we've had those observation sites. This one we um, is a central um, project, so the Langhorn Creek Grape and Wine along with the Adelaide Hills and McLaren Vale. So I'd just like to thank um, Dr Richard Hamilton who does some of the work through the Adelaide Hills in helping me identify sites. Obviously AGWA um, for the funding, um, Landmark for giving me some time. A lot of this is done um, at night. I sit at home and we I go through all the, the um, you know, assessment of the leaves and that sort of stuff and the products donated from Bayer Dow Dow Agro Sciences, Sokoa and Sumitomo. So that's where we're at. I'm sorry I don't have a um, something that we can go out and control scale with at this point. We've got some a step forward in, in some products that may work but really um, we've still got a bit of a way to go. So I'll just leave it there and we'll open it up for some questions. Great, thank you for that Jenny, some really good information there. Um, like Jenny said, we'll roll straight into a Q&A from here. Um, we've already got a number of questions and we'll get to them in a minute, but for those who haven't attended a Q&A previously, to ask a question just type it into the bottom section of your control panel and click to send it through. Right, so I'm just having a look where I find the questions, so just um, bear with me for a moment. Right. So the first question I he have here um, from Craig is, what effect, if any, of the trialled products have on flowering, say paraffinetic oil gumming up pollen and the pollen tubes uh, preventing pollination? So when we use the paraffinetic oil, it was used at the powdery mildew rate, so Paraffinetic oil is registered at three litres per hundred as a scale control in winter. Through the season it's only at one litre a hectare, so we only used it at the powdery mildew rate. And the other thing to be aware around paraffinetic oil is obviously burn in association with sulphur. Um, so that if you have a sulphur spray close to that oil spray, you can induce a phytotoxic effect and burn. From the work and the reading I've done, I haven't seen a problem um, in terms of the paraffinetic oil causing a problem with flowering and pollination, um, but that probably wasn't our main area of, of research that we were looking at and um, it certainly will be something I put back to Sokoa to find out, but it is registered um, as a product for use through the season. Uh, the next one from Greg Moles is a general comment. Some of the soft scale appear as citricola scale, often confused with soft brown scale. So I'll probably follow that up with Greg. Um, as I said, I'm not an entomologist by any um, stretch of the imagination, so that's why we're putting this out there to industry. If there's people out there, I know we, we're looking at having Stuart Learmouth from Perth or Western Australia. Um, to help us identify this so if anyone else recognises some of these that would be great. 
Um, do we know, so the next question, do we know the spray history of the heavily infested blocks properties? Um, look, I'm doing some work um, with those growers. Some of them had used um, Avatar, but probably not since 2011. So certainly we are seeing a link between Avatar and some of the blocks that have um, scale, but that's certainly not exclusive. We do have blocks where Avatar hasn't been used and we're seeing scale, um, but we do think that probably Avatar isn't the greatest product uh, and we are starting to see, you know, the, the Adelaide Hills often don't have a choice um, if you've got garden weevil, um, we often have to use uh, Avatar because there isn't another choice. Um, but you know we're, we're sort of looking as to whether we can reduce the number of avatar sprays um, in our sites. Uh, Craig's got another question. So Samurai soil health um, effects known. Uh, look, Samurai does remain in the soil um, and it's obviously taken up by the, the vines. Um, I am in discussion with Sumitomo at the moment um, because obviously lots of these things are coming up from the growers where we're going to do the trial um, and it has only just come onto the radar as one of the products we will probably trial. So to answer that thoroughly Craig, no, I probably can't give a, a concise answer to what the soil health effects will be and that's where we're at at the moment. We know that the Group 4A insecticides, there was a lot of publicity around them um, through Europe given the effect that um, the Group 4A neonicotinoids have on bees and um, bees collecting pollen and taking it back to their hives and causing death um, to, to beehives. Um, certainly probably in vines we don't see as many, bees definitely forage but probably not as many as you see in stone fruit, so we, you know, we still are concerned about that um, effect that samurai may have on the bee population and I'm in discussion with them about um, other effects that samurai will have. Question from John, um, has there been any work done with Admiral? Um, apparently it's dynamite on olive scale. Um, I've had, so Admiral is another product um, from Sumitomo and I have looked into Admiral. The problem with Admiral or, or the drawback with Admiral is that it is also a um, growth regulator type product. So the timing that we are similar to Mavento and Applaud, but the timing of these products is the problem that we have in that the scale the majority of the scale are hatching after 80% catfall um, and to try and get into the canopy at that time and hit those crawlers is very difficult. In olives they can spray right through the season and have a very open canopy often. Um, the other thing about Admiral is it's not registered in grapevines at all so at this point um, we're more looking towards Samurai rather than Admiral, but I have looked into Admiral and we will consider that maybe as part of the trial after discussion with Sumitomo. Uh, Stephen, what are the causes of condition, okay, I'll read that properly. What are the causes of conditions for and control of sooty mould? So really, um, once again, sooty mould really comes on once the scale are feeding a lot, so when the scale feed, they take in a lot of sugar, particularly as, as the grapes ripen and they're feeding on the sap and they don't need that sugar so that is excluded and then the sooty mould grows on that. Particularly in seasons where we have um, longer vintages and the cooler conditions, the sooty mould certainly seems to really get going. In terms of the particular conditions, we probably don't know a lot about that yet. Um, certainly big canopies with not a lot of airflow, similar to conditions to what you get botrytis in, seem to be conducive to sooty mould. But we certainly need the mealybug and the scale producing um, honeydew, which then the sooty mould comes on to. So it's, it's a secondary really to the scale and the mealybug. Is there any con consideration to trial any softer chemistry as a post-harvest application? Right, so in terms of post-harvest, we did do 
um, two trials post-harvest, certainly not with softer chemistry, they were with um, chlorpyrifos. So the minute the grower had finished harvesting all his blocks, so we didn't have any um, problems with drift, the grower, while the scale was still moving back into the bar, into the um, main canes, we sprayed with chlorpyrifos and we, we got quite a good control. Um, probably, we're still doing some assessments now actually and we probably got you know, 80% control out of those sprays. We didn't put any um, oil with those because we were concerned about still getting some hot weather and some photos of chlorpyrifos mixed with an oil. And certainly at that time we also did some applaud and those um, applaud Mavento we looked at but the scale weren't growing and we really need those products um, work for the, if the scale is molting and because they're growth regulators. So at that point we weren't sure whether we would get the correct um, response and we will look at that again um, at the end of vintage because we'll be probably a bit more prepared to get those sprays out quickly before leaf drop. So at the moment we haven't done a lot of that but it's certainly something that um, I will probably include um, this year. Is there, from uh, the next one is, is there a way to remove the honeydew before it becomes um, mould. So that was really, we probably went in a little bit late with those trials where we tried to wash it off. So as I said there was some work uh, and is some work done in Western Australia where they flush canopies. Obviously their canopies are, tend to be more VSP, very lifted so those sprays can get in. We probably came in a little bit late with trying to wash it off. So we also did some ones with just water trying to go through and flush it off. We had some rain around that time which certainly seemed to reduce the level of honeydew in the, in the vineyard but you know, it seemed to come back quite quickly. So at this point, you know, leaving the scale there and trying just to manage the honeydew doesn't seem to be the best approach. Um, it, it is very sticky um, and very difficult to remove from bunches. So really once we're at that point, it's really a, a bit of a fight against the honeydew and the sooty mould that then comes in. Um, we'll probably look at that a little bit more but at this point no. Um, if scale is found in an uh, organic biodynamic vineyard, what can be done? So that's probably obviously we're looking at um, and why, to some degree why we included initially the um, paraphernetic oils, the biopest and those. I'm not 100% sure at this point that they are organically registered but hence why we're looking at sort of the eco-carbs, um, the biopest and those sort of things because really even in a conventional vineyard if we can avoid using OPs we will um, and even samurai would be a once off and not use it again for three or four years but you obviously can't use that in an organic or a biodynamic. So hence we will continue with that looking at rates of the oil sprays um, in, in dormancy and also in season to see if we can get those products available for organic dynamic vineyards. Uh, we've got one from Suzanne. Do you know if any of the chemicals that are unregistered at present that you are trialling are also being trialled by those chemical companies for the purpose of scale registration. So I should mention that all of that trial work was done in conjunction with the chemical companies. So the chemical companies um, donated the product for us to trial um, and Hugh Armstrong helped me with some of that and helped me with working out how to monitor them. Um, and obviously they are keen if we can get um, numbers that are sufficient and are going to work to get those products registered. At this point, and that's why we will do another um, year, at this point we just don't think that those products um, are controlling the scale enough to um, get registration of those products but certainly if we can get scale numbers down or find some vineyards that have lower scale numbers then we'll do some more work around that to try and get some um, softer chemistry registered for scale control. Uh, is there a difference in your findings in terms of numbers and effects? 
uh, between organic and biodynamic and conventional blocks. Um, that's from Matt Wilson. Um, at the moment, I probably don't look at a number at enough organic or biodynamic vineyards to know. I do look at one organic vineyard and to date we haven't found any scale but I've looked at a lot of conventional vineyards and we haven't found scale. So um, I can't categorically say that organic biodynamic vineyards don't have scale but I'm not getting the feedback from those vineyards. So we, we do think that there has been something in conventional vineyards that has induced scale um, numbers to get out of um, balance. And obviously if we look at last year um, in other crops we had the can canola with um, the beet virus caused by um, aphids and you know that was a very unusual thing and obviously this year we've had you know an explosion of scale numbers. So it, it may be climatic that in years where we don't have a very cold winter, we get higher scale numbers, hence why we're looking at monitoring some of that temperature and, and effect of temperature on scale. Uh, do I have another one? So will any biological controls such as WASPs be trialled? So um, yes, we are, I harped on a little bit there about trying to identify the scale and working out what scale we have and working with um, Mike Keller and obviously with Dr Paul Cooper in, in um, ANU now hopefully to identify the scale because unless we know what particular species of scale we're working with, um, we can't introduce a particular biological control that will be effective against it. The other work that was done by the PhD student um, out of Victoria, I think it was a few years ago, tended to indicate that there actually weren't a lot of um, biological controls that were effective against scale, um, that they weren't parasitised um, that readily and I know in all the work I've done looking at scale under the microscope I don't often see any of that drilling out that is classic in some of the photos where a wasp has um, laid an egg and they're drilling out of the scale shell so certainly we really want to focus on that identification so that then we can go um, to some of the people that do the, the biological controls and the cover cropping work to try and introduce some, some softer options. Uh, do you have some trade names for some paraphernetic oils? So, so the paraphernetic oils are the biopest and um, there's another one as well that I think I had earlier on my presentation. Um, so anything really that is close to 100% paraphernetic rather than the broad spectrum mineral oils um, certainly is what um, the guys that do the citrus work say. So. Um, Biopest is one of them but um, Paul I can send you some other trade names as well if you're interested later. We must be uh, a couple more to go. Was there any particular size lens you use to check scale in the field? Um, once you get your eye in and you turn over the leaf um, really once you know they're there, they're, they're generally fairly easy to see. If they're sitting along the veins, um, just a, a 10 times hand lens is enough. Um, and certainly I took lots of photos just with an iPhone um, and the little camera I have has a, a microscope function. But a, a 10 times um, hand lens, obviously once you start seeing mealybug um, and you saw that photo with the mealybug compared to a scale, um, once you get your eye in, um, you can see them with, the, with just your eye, but certainly a 10 times hand lens helps. Are the major wine companies, this is from Hugo, um, are there the major wine companies getting on board to help find some options that are uh, comfortable with, that they're comfortable with. So Samurai, um, look certainly I have um, lots of discussions with the major wine companies um, about options and um, you know trialling some of these products and looking then at, at maybe a um, limited registration or going back to Sumitomo or the other companies to try and get these registered. So certainly um, I'm not working in isolation. I have lots of discussions with the major wine companies and some of the smaller companies about making them a, 
them aware and they're very aware that this is becoming a problem and that we may need to opt um, after we've trialled these products and, and make sure that they're effective um, to including them again in the front of the dog book rather than the back of the dog book or that they are giving um, the OK for growers to use them. But that's obviously up to each individual wine company. Oh, we must be getting close. I yes, we've, um, we haven't got any further questions at this stage, Jenny. Um, might give it another 30 seconds to see if any final ones flow through, but did you have any <laughs> final comments or did you want to put any questions out to any particular audience members? Or So I, I think you can see that we're still a long way from having um, a perfect control measure for scale, but look, I'm really keen um, for growers to and, and other viticulturalists from some of the other companies um, to, to offer solutions and things for us to trial. As I said, it is a, a small regional project that we're running, but you know, I think if we can get the awareness out there that maybe scale is some of the reasons that vines uh, have reduced vigour um, and maybe causing that sooty mould and causing um, impacts on your vineyard, that it, it's certainly worth going out and having a look to know to peel back the bark and have a look under the bark where the, the bark is just tending to, to crack is often where you find them on spurs. So no, look, I'm happy to take calls from anyone that, that has you know, interest in scale and trying to trying to control it. Um, and, and yeah, we'll go from there. And certainly um, the project that I did, we I will write it up so we'll have all that data available. Um, and then we'll just, um, you know, do some more trialling this year to see, see where we go to. So that's about it. Thanks very much for listening. Sorry, Jenny, we've got just one final question that um, has come through just now and um, we'll wrap up after that if you're happy to answer that one. So we've got, oops, we've got one come in from the Adelaide Hills. Um, the scale which we have mainly observed in the Adelaide Hills does not have the frosted appearance and has two distinct generations this season. Could it be European fruit scale? Um, so certainly it could be and that's why I'm now trying to get um, some of the entomologists on board um, to help us do this identification. Um, MIND has really been based on Google um, and what we find on the internet and from literature searches. Um, and I've just listed those six because that was what was found in the PhD that was done a couple of years ago in vineyards. And I'm certainly not excluding um, any of the other soft bodied scale um, that may be coming in from fruit trees or other things. Um, so yeah, we might send these off and, and find that they're completely different to what we initially thought. Um, so no, I'll certainly include that and thanks to Lee um, for mentioning that. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you very much to Jenny for uh, presenting today and thank you to everyone who has attended and participated. Um, all attendees will receive an email this afternoon with a link to a survey. Uh, please tell us what you think. We really do value your feedback. Um, should you need to follow up on anything from today, please contact Jenny or the AWRO.